Well, I hope you enjoyed that song, and I hope you did pay attention to the words. Mary, did you know? I ran off a copy of the lyrics to that song because I think it's more significant than just the beautiful song that it is. I think it's a powerful message. And I want to go back through some of that as we begin our time together today. I want to make sure that we're focused on that idea. What did Mary know? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? And that this child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to the blind man? Did you know that your baby boy would calm the storm with his hand? Did you know your baby boy has walked where angels trod? And when you kissed your little baby, you kissed the face of God. Did you know the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again, the lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the Lamb? Did you know, Mary, that your baby boy was the Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb and the sleeping child you're holding is the great I am? Mary, did you know? Well, Mary was a young teenage girl. What did she know? What was she thinking? What did she feel? How did she feel? Well, today's teenage girls are concerned with things like body image. Am I too short? Am I too tall? Am I too big? Am I too small? Am I not physically developed enough? Am I overdeveloped? Am I uncomfortable with my own skin? Am I uncomfortable with what others think? about me? I, am I accepted in the right social groups? Do adults take me seriously? What do boys think of me? Do adults even listen to me? Do they care about what I say, about how I feel, about what I think? According to a recent psychological study, teenage girls are concerned with all of these things that I just mentioned. One of the other prominent characteristics of teenage girls is the way they seem to process every event that happens in their life. If something makes them angry, they are extremely angry. If something makes them excited, they are extremely excited. If something makes them sad, guess what? <laughs> They're extremely sad. If they are in love, they are extremely head over heels in love. Everything is supersized in the life of a teenage girl. But 2,000 years ago, things were quite different. Girls were barely in their teenage years when they were married. The average age of a girl who was married 2,000 years ago was between 12 and 13 years of age. And in some instances, girls would be married by the time they were nine years old. That's old enough to conceive and nurse a baby. The idea back then was when the menstrual cycle began, they were old enough to be married. And in those days, oftentimes 9, 10, 11 years old was the timing of all of that. 
Now, boys, on the other hand, and I do use the term boys intentionally because a boy who would get married at that time typically would be 13 to 15 years of age. Now, the idea of this betrothal or this engagement that uh, took place back then was a year to set aside and protect the purity of the girl. They wanted to have some type of guarantee that the girl had not been sexually active before marriage, even at that young age, and so the betrothal or the engagement would take place over a year. And if the girl proved not to be pure, there was a problem because according to the law, it was death by stoning. Well, at this young age, the girl would have spent her formative years alongside of her mother, learning the skills of what? Housekeeping and child rearing. And uh, one of the reasons that it seems like children married so young was because everybody was in the family business. And so if you had a child who had children, that means you would have more people growing up in your family to help with the family business. The more, the merrier. And many hands make light work. And so children growing up, having children, contributed to the family business, to the economics, to the security, and to the future of that family. Well, in contrast, today, according to a survey in 2018, the average age of a girl getting married today is 27.8 years old. And the average age for a male getting married today is 29.8 years. Well, the fact that Mary this young lady was engaged and gave birth at this time of her life is really not the story here. In fact, that would be the norm. Well, I want to take a look this morning at Luke chapter 1, and I want to read to you the entire passage. I think it's important to understand God's Word and to understand the context from which we gather these stories and the principles that we talk about at times like today. And so I want to go to Luke chapter 1, and I want to read from verse 26 on. So if you have your Bibles, you may want to turn there with me. Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. I want you to make a note of that. Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. What kind of greeting could this be? Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Again, you notice that. We have the greeting, favored woman, and now we have the uh, greeting from the angel, do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, the angel says to Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary asked the angel, how can this be, since I have not had sexual relations with a man? And the angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of of God. They consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. 
Again, I draw your attention to that phrase, and nothing will be impossible with God. And the story continues, and it's evident that Mary believes that. She believes that nothing is impossible with God. And she responds, see, I am the Lord's servant, Mary said, the Lord's servant. May it happen to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. And then Mary, she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth in verse 39. And in those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside her. And we know now that was John the baptizer, John the Baptist. And Elizabeth, her cousin, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and your child will be blessed. And how could this happen to me? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped for joy inside of me. And notice this very important line. We talked about Mary understanding the idea that nothing is impossible with God. Blessed, verse 45, is she, speaking of Mary, who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he has spoken to her. And then verse 46, Mary breaks out in praise. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. And remember verse 38, Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. And now in her prayer, she says he looks at favor on the humble condition of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed because the mighty one has done great things for me. And his name is holy. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. He has done mighty, a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel remembering his mercy to Abraham, that's important, she mentions Abraham here, and his descendants forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors. And Mary stayed with her, with Elizabeth, about three months. Then she returned home. Well, as I started, stated before, the idea that Mary was 12 or 13 years old and was engaged and then gave birth is not really the story here. The first part of the story surrounds the power of the Most High who came into the life of Mary, entered her womb, and planted the very seed of God. We read that in verse 35, so the virgin conceived. That is a big deal. It really is. The idea here is that Mary was the virgin chosen by God, favored by God to be the vessel to bring the Christ child into the world. The virgin birth of Jesus is the foundation of the Christian faith. The sacrifice for sin had to be the perfect Lamb of God. There could be nothing humanly that would taint the sacrifice that God would offer for our sins. It had to be a perfect sacrifice, and that could only be brought about by the virgin birth. Today, however, my attention is not on that. As significant and foundational as that doctrine is, today I want to look at the 
young lady that God chose to bring forth his son into the world. In verse 28, Mary is referred to as a favored woman. And again in verse 30, you have found favor with God. If you look at Mary in her life, you will note that there are several characteristics that I think are somewhat unique to her. Maybe they shouldn't be that unique to those who claim to be God followers. But I think in her culture, because she was selected by God and favored by God, there were some things that stood out to God that demonstrated her uniqueness. It demonstrated something was special about her. And today I want to look at four qualities that I think stood out in the eyes of God and stand out to us today. Now, as I was studying this, I actually came up with six more qualities. But we're not going to take the time to look at all of those. We're going to look at four that I think are very significant. Well, here's the first thing I noticed about Mary. Mary exercised profound humility. She exercised profound humility. Verse 38 says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be done to me according to your word. To say that you're anyone's servant, I think, illustrates a humble uh, spirit. The Greek word for servant here is doula. It is the feminine of doulas. If you read the Gospels, and then you move on to the epistles, and you get into the writings of Paul, he often starts his writings with Paul, a servant, a doulas, a bond slave, of Jesus Christ. Well, this is the feminine of that word, doula, and it means bond slave. Some translations have uh, translated that word in this passage as handmaid. It's the same idea. Mary placed herself completely at God's disposal, even though she knew or did not know what the outcome would be. She did know that this idea of being pregnant and not yet married could bring disgrace to her and to her family and certainly would raise the eyebrows of those in the neighborhood. But as a servant, as a doula, as a handmaid of God who was at his beck and call, no matter what the request was, with a humble spirit she accepted the call of God into her life. Mary even noted in her words of praise in verse 48, because he has looked on me with favor on the humble condition of his servant. Some translations say of Mary that she was of low estate. It refers to the fact that Mary was not from a wealthy family. She was, in the eyes of others, very poor and probably under-resourced. Not the kind of person that you would think the king of kings would choose to make his stay here on planet Earth with. But I find it interesting that God seems to continually choose the underdogs. Those that you might think have the power, the prestige, the position to enter into some type of a service for God. But he chooses them. Just think of Gideon. He was the least in his family. Moses, he couldn't speak. Little shepherd boy David going up against the giant Goliath. Think of Jonathan who went with his armor bearer up against the battalion of Philistine soldiers. And the list goes on and on. All of these people accomplished great things with God, for God, because what? They had a humble spirit. The first thing I notice about Mary is that she had a very humble spirit. She exercised profound humility. God, whatever it is you want, I am here to serve you. I am your handmaid. I am your doula. 
Well, the second thing that I note about Mary is that she exhibited a living faith. She exhibited a living faith. Again, I go back to verse 38. May it be done according to your word. Mary had plans. So did Joseph. They had planned to get married in the coming year. They were going to start a family, live in the carpenter shop. They were going to live in their hometown, make lots of matzo balls and pita bread and hummus and enjoy life as it was in those days. But it all changed because of the favor of God. So she lived a life that was not the life she had planned, but it was a life of faith. Mary's attitude was, if this is what God says and this is what God wants, I'm all in. I'm all in. See, having a living faith means that we take God at his word. And the word of God came through that angelic host to Mary. Mary, you will conceive and you will bear a son. You will call him Jesus. Whatever you want, God, I'm with you. I'm all in. Having a living faith means that when God speaks, we answer. Having a living faith means that we count our life only worthy when it's living in the will of God. Mary had a living faith. Gary Stratman, who's a pastor in the Midwest, wrote an article, I believe it was in Moody Monthly, a couple of years back. And here's what he said that I thought was interesting about this life of faith. He said, it's really crazy, isn't it? Here we are listening to the same story again. Who doesn't know how it's going to come out? The plot doesn't change from year to year. Every shepherd is in place. The star is shining on cue. No matter how predictable, we do keep listening. We lean forward with anticipation for somehow, despite the too familiar details, we believe that this story is about us. What if God does invade a world of business as usual? You do what you do to survive? What if the angel's message to Mary, what was that message? The Lord is with you. Is God's message to us? If we want to find ourselves in this ancient but life-giving tale, we need to look at the one who received the word of assurance. Remember, the Lord is with you. That was Mary. For in her, we see the one Karl Barth talked about when he said, the figure that Ray is raised above all the figures of Advent is Mary. In John, we may see our need to prepare the way of the Lord, but in Mary, we see the even greater need to prepare room for him. In her, we see the response of faith. I don't know if you ever considered this, but it was by faith that Mary received the message from the angel. It was by faith that Mary made room for Jesus to come into her life in spite of all the disruption that it would cause. And it's only by faith that you make room for Jesus in your life as well. Mary exhibited a living faith. Well, the third thing is Mary experienced a blind faith. She experienced a blind faith. We go back to verses 34 and 37. It says, Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I have not had sexual relationships with a man? And the angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived the son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who is called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. Now, I wonder if Mary 
at 12, 13 years of age, understood the history of Israel, of her ancestors. I do believe that she did, amazingly as it may sound. I think Mary somehow knew the story of Genesis 12. She did not know the writing of the author of Hebrews, but in Hebrews 11, it does say, by faith, when Abraham was called, obeyed, and set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance, he went out even though he did not know where he was going. Listen, I don't think that we can think for one minute that Mary knew where this was all headed. I don't think she knew. Mary, did you know? I don't think Mary had any idea where this road would lead. It was a winding road. It went from Nazareth to Bethlehem to Jerusalem to Egypt, back to Nazareth, and then all around the area of Galilee. I don't think Mary knew. And yet, Mary went, even though she did not know where the road would lead. And I like the fact that in her prayer, she mentions her ancestor Abraham. She had an understanding of what living by faith was. Her ancestor Abraham was called to go to a land that he did not know where it was, and he went, and she also under the direction of an angelic host, received orders to go, to change her life, to put everything she had planned on hold and walk a new road. And she went, even though she did not know where that road would lead. Mary experienced blind faith. She went, even though she did not know where she was going. And here's the fourth thing I want to have us think about today. Mary extolled God through continual conversation. We first notice this in verses 45 and 46 in her prayer of praise, and then we see it again, I believe, in chapter 2 and verse 19, where it says, Mary treasured up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. You see, if you go back to verse 46, It simply says, and Mary said. I like that. I like that. That really got my attention. Because it's apparent to me that after her visit with Elizabeth, or during her visit, I should say, and Elizabeth pointed to her as the blessed one who is going to bring forth her Lord, these words just rolled off of her lips from her heart. It's apparent somehow, and I don't understand it, how the words of a 12 or 13-year-old girl could say these words if she had never been in conversation with God before. I believe that one of the reasons that God found favor with Mary was because Mary had been in conversation with God from a very young age. I think that's one of the reasons God found favor with her. I think having a conversation with God was not a new experience. I think it was probably part of her routine, even at 12 and 13 years of age. Go back and read from verse 46 on down through there and think of a 12-year-old girl processing all of that. I think it's incredible. But I think... Mary was highly favored with God because she had been in conversation with God for her formative years. I would have liked to have known about her parents, the house that she grew up in, the influence that they must have had on her. Certainly there was an influence on her that brought her to the place where she could communicate with God like she did. But it wasn't only at that place. It was, again, after the child came that she treasured all these things up in her heart and she meditated on it all. You see, Mary, I believe, had a God consciousness throughout this entire experience. 
and she extolled God through continual conversation. Mary, did you know? I don't believe that Mary had any idea of all that Jesus would do and all that God would do through her. And I think that makes the story of Mary so incredible. I also think it makes it very challenging for us today. Think about it. Christians say that they want to be like Jesus, and that is a noble goal, and that should be the goal for each and every Christ follower, to every day be more and more like our Savior. But maybe a good place to start would be to be a little bit more like Mary. To have a profound, a life that reflected profound humility. To have a living faith. To have a blind faith. To have a continual conversation with God. Mary, did you know? (laughs) I don't think she did. But here's the thing. We know today, don't we? We know that Jesus walked on water. We know that he gave sight to the blind. We know that he raised the dead. We know that he died on the cross for our sins. And we know he's coming back. We know we have no excuse to live a life of humility, of living faith, of blind faith, and of continual conversation with God. Well, we close with another song today I think is very appropriate. So we're going to pray and commit our time to the Lord today. And again, I encourage you to listen carefully to the song, Breath of Heaven. Father, thank you for the testimony of Mary. Thank you for the life that she lived, the life of faith, life of trust in you, going places where she did not even know, but because you sent her, she went. Father, might we reflect some of that in our own lives, to be open to your word, to your leading, to a God consciousness that allows us to be in communication with you every moment of every day. Again, thank you for this time. We pray that you will bless it. Pray that you will continually challenge us with the story. Might it not just be a seasonal thought, but might it be on our hearts and minds as we move forward on this journey we call life. Well, thank you for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless, and have a blessed day.